Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Analyzing Anfield, your tactics and analytics podcast, podcast courtesy of the Blood Red Channel. I'm Josh Williams, and this week I am joined by Mo Stewart. Mo, welcome back to the show, mate. How do you feel? Very good, very good. I had a refreshing time away. It's kind of like um, I went around when, when you're a manager and you've not got a job at the moment, you go around to others see how they're getting on see how they work so <laughs> I, I did a little bit of that a bit of guesting on some other shows and i'm back and refreshed and ready to hit you yeah well uh we have missed you mate um there's been a short term loan in the process since you've been <laughs> away uh andrew beasley was a bit of a star yes. man to be honest uh really good performances on the show and it was good to get his views and stuff um but a couple of weeks ago when we when we initially lost yeah obviously the reaction was was very very good on youtube in terms of like get him back basically um so we've we've made that happen and um i think it was quite relevant the other day when i sent you that picture of him <laughs> for, for, for those who aren't aware this was kind of above our heads and um the first message back after it had kind of been rekindled was me sending Mo a picture of um rafa benitez and robbie fowler <laughs> <laughs> which i mean I, I kind of liked the, the esteem that you were holding me and I did feel a little bit kind of sheepish about it. But I did want to say thank you to everyone who sent messages saying, get me back. And also thank you to Andrew. Like there's been so many times when I've been writing and when I've been talking on shows where I've leaned on his expertise to make me sound better. So yeah, uh, <laughs> big shout out to Andrew. Yeah, well, I'm sure he'll be he'll be back on the podcast eventually at some point, no doubt. Um, but yeah, we'll get back into it anyway. So we have missed about a month in terms of having a conversation about Liverpool. And in that time, we've improved, to be honest. Yes. With you. I hope you're not a bad luck charm, to be honest. Um, yeah, you're not the first person who said that. But um, <laughs> I'm hoping it too, to be fair. Yeah, so Liverpool are currently, I think, unbeaten in seven. Um, and they've won five in a row, and six of these games have been using a new look shape with possession, at least. Um, I haven't actually asked you, it feels like a while ago now, but I haven't actually asked you what you think of this new 3 2 5 kind of shape, is what I'm calling it. Yeah. Um, but I, I like it, me. I, I think it's very good. But what about yourself? I do like it. I must admit, when it first came in, I was very intrigued as to how it was going to work out because I did think it suited some more than others within the team and the squad. But over the course of the games, they've kind of been working out some of the kinks and now it appears that everybody feels a little bit more comfortable with what they've been asked to do. And I do think it's uh, something that's got real merit. Obviously, the standout is that Trent Alexander-Arnold's is in a new position that's allowed him to be a lot more creative with the ball and have a little bit more um, defensive protection when it comes to players getting in behind in that space. I also think it's been great for Mo Salah because I do think that we've now been able to get him isolated with only one defender in front of him a little bit more. But I do think it's one of those situations where you wonder whether or not this is just another short-term fix because we have periodically seen that from Klopp. I mean, I think we've seen about four of them so far this season. The season has been long. The season has been very long. <laughs> but um, so whether or not this is just another way of trying to mask the lack of intensity in pressing from our central midfielders, and if that is something that once uh, solved in the transfer market, that it goes back to. But I've liked the good things that we've seen from it so far. And I think that in terms of some of the kinks as i mentioned i do think that there are souls within the squad so if we wanted to do it long term i think there is a possibility yeah i mean since we started using it liverpool have only just kept the clean sheet with it actually which was last night mm -hmm. um but i think despite that i do think generally we've been better defensively with it um i think one of the things it's massively improved is just the counter press um yeah because it's allowed Liverpool to have four bodies in the centre of the park. One of them is Curtis Jones, who, who I think has been brilliant lately and really keen when it comes to closing the opponents down. And on the other side of the box, you've got Jordan Henderson, who over the course of his career, probably his biggest strength has been 
harrying opponents. Um, and if he's positioned in that number 10 kind of role, he's already really high in the final third and stuff. So mm-hmm. I think it's allowed Liverpool to regain the ball much better than we have done throughout the season in terms of just putting pressure on the ball and things like that. Um, and in attack so far, I do think we're still finding our feet with it um, in attack, even though we've scored a fair few goals of late. Um, but as you say, I think the star probably has been Trent. I think, uh, yeah. I mean, it, I must have, I must be honest, he's, he's, he hasn't surprised me because it's, it's, it's obvious that he's technically brilliant and amazing when he's in possession of the ball and, and can do all these kinds of things. But the ease at which he's made the shift and um, the authority that he's already got in the middle of the pitch, I think is just testament to how good he is as a as a generational player who is not, but it was potentially not just a generational right back. But since he's been moved into the middle, he's he's looked like a standout player even in that position as well. So I think it's really highlighted just how good he is, and and maybe. Um, it's kind of emphasised that regardless of what Klopp does in, in like the next season or whatever, getting the most out of him is is right near the top of the priority list for me. Oh, 100%. He is our generational superstar. Obviously, we were trying to get another one and we failed, but we've got one. <laughs> and, uh, I think he's going to be so key to everything we do. I, I, I am going to give him all the credit in the world because I did think he would struggle. I've been a little bit of on the fence to the point of maybe negative on the whole idea of Trent in midfield in general. I think, obviously, he grew up as a midfielder, but part of the reason why I was saying is I always thought that some of the struggles he had at right back, namely uh, seeing defenders on either shoulder, one-on-one tackling, were still going to be a problem in central midfield. He has been able to get around those things in in a really unique way, I think. I think... The thing that I've been most impressed with is his ability to do the midfield things in terms of protecting the ball, uh, recycling possession, but also being more aware of everything in his surroundings because that is the hardest part of changing from right back to central midfield. You've got so many more players, so many more positions, so many more things to think about on top of all of the whole attacking ideas and trying to play these great passes. So for him to be able to take in all of that information and be able to process it almost instinctively is is remarkable. It is remarkable to me. The thing I like about it defensively, but something I noticed at the game last night, is that he is still nominally in the right back position when Fulham are starting attacks. So when the opposition goalkeeper has the ball, up until it arrives around the edge of their defensive third, He's a right back. He's in the back line with four players. If he sees an opportunity to press or to steal the ball once the ball travels from there, then he has freedom to go in and dart. So if you're trying to game plan against it, you aren't able to say, well, he's always doing this, he's always doing that. He has the ability, the freedom to make that decision when he comes out, when he comes in. And I think that's going to be so key as well. Yeah, I think, um, as, as you say, when it comes to this movement into midfield, obviously he is technically still a right-back. It's an inverted position when it comes to Liverpool getting possession of the ball. Um, but I did wonder whether it would whether it would kind of impact his, his progressive passes. I think I thought it would maybe have a bit of an impact in terms of negative, and I thought potentially his, his tendency to create chances for his teammates I thought would take a bit of a drop simply because as you say he's just he's just not in as much space yeah. as he would pick up as a fullback um maybe not as advanced in terms of being high up the pitch a lot more bodies around him a lot more of a clogged packed space in terms of playing those progressive passes forwards but it really doesn't feel watching him like it's impacted them at all in fact yeah. if it kind of feels like it's given him a bit of a a new challenge, a new lease of life, almost kind of um, proving people wrong that he that he can do it. Um, and as I said, so far he's just done it with ease. I mean, I was at the game last night and just just watching him the way he receives the ball was was so comfortable. I felt like any time Liverpool did progress up the pitch towards like the final third and beyond, 
it was only ever Trent playing those passes. Everybody else was kind of, you know, it was backwards, it was lateral, it was yeah. safe. And it was like Trent was the one who was responsible for accelerating the game in the right moments. And, um, you know, it, it, that's quite a responsibility for a player who is who has been playing in central midfield for a couple of games. He just, I think he looks like he's been doing it for years already. Yeah, and maybe, maybe he's been lobbying for this behind the scenes for, for a while and he's been saying, yes, I can do this. And now that's why he's taken with it with so much gusto. But you're right, there was one moment last night where he just lets the ball run across him and does a brilliant turn. And he kind of steps on the ball, rolls around it. And I was like, wait, is that Zidane? No, wait, that's Trent Alexander-Arnold. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's just, he's having fun, but he's also able to do it within the structure of the team and responsibility. And I think that that's really important as well. The point you make about him being the only one able to make those passes is key as well, because for the rest of the guys, it was almost like their function was to recycle the pos possession to a point to get Trent with a little bit of space so he can play his pass. It's almost like if you think about an NBA team where they're basically making runs this way and that way just to get clear space for this other guy, that's pretty much the same thing that was happening when we were passing the ball around in midfield. <clears throat> I think the other part that's really important and really interesting in this is the fact that the three-man structure of the defence, rather than having two centre-halves and then having a defensive midfielder, midfielder drop back into it, when you've got three there, they're a little bit more comfortable in covering that space. And I think that's something to maybe look for, to in the future, whether we decide to stay with this trend in midfield or not. I do think having three centre-backs is something we might see a little bit more than we had seen previously. Yeah, well, that's I suppose that's the interesting question at the minute. Is is this a short term fix? Is it a permanent switch for a, for for quite a while moving forward? I mean, as I said, I keep saying it. We we are still four three three on the defensive side of the game. It's just a, I suppose, a quite a drastic rotation that we've added into our possession game, where Trent does occupy spaces as a number six next to Fabinho. One thing I noticed yesterday, I'm not sure if the TV cameras picked it up, but in the ground, the whole like back three thing where the left back is supposed to tuck in, I didn't think it happened as much last night. Yeah. I thought it was kind of Trent tucking in as a midfielder, but Costa still playing as a left back, and Van Dijk and Canate just expected to cover these massive spaces yeah. if, if the ball does move forward. And I think if we think about that, I do think there's a lot of responsibility and a lot of reliance on on Canate's ability to just mm -hmm. almost just do everything as a real sweeper. Um, he's covering a lot of the ground. He's doing a lot of running, um, a lot of slide tackling at times, which he's he's winning them a lot as well. He's winning his duels, but yeah. it's that's a very demanding role. What what he's doing there, and I think Joel Massa, for example, I know he did it okay the other week. I think it was against Leeds, maybe. Was it was it against Leeds? Massa played. Mm, I, I think it was what West Ham. West Ham, yeah, yeah. Well, um, I feel like if you if you were asking Massa to do that every other week, he's probably doing his hamstring inside two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, he's not he's not covering that ground. And this goes back to what I was saying before about how it's it's suitable to some players and not others. I did worry slightly about Robertson in that three centre back position because. Most other teams do play three centre-halves and he hasn't really had that experience in that role. And it does. he does also, a lot of his benefit is getting up and down and you can't really do that as much when you're playing as a centre-half. But he seems to have kind of adapted it. Costas is even less suited to it, to be honest, because not only is that his game equally getting up and down, but concentration, discipline. <laughs> These are not things that are high up on the Costas list. To be fair to him, last night, I thought he did okay. I thought focus-wise, there was I didn't do that watching him once. And that, that's a win with Costas, I think. But <laughs> in all seriousness, it, you're right. It does it does affect recruitment, recruitment in terms of who we are looking at, what things we want to yeah. do. Because if we are going to be playing three centre-halves, then we're probably going to need a guy who can be a left-back or a left-sided centre-back. And then that means, do you want him and Robertson and Costas? And 
there are all these different kind of decisions that you've got to make. But the other thing, and possibly the biggest um, thing in Klopp's mind in terms of going to three centre halves is Virgil, because I mean he is human, and we've seen he's been more Clark Kent than Superman this season, and I think that's me yeah. putting it quite kindly. And he doesn't have the juice, maybe, to go out and become Superman again as often as we want him to and need him to. So maybe having a guy either side of him allows him to still be the best version of himself in a way that happens with his national team. Because it has looked great for Holland. And I know that there are lots of reasons in the past that Klopp said he doesn't like 3-5-2 or 3-4-3 or however variant you want to put it. I think when he if, he, if he's going to be looking at the guys he's got and the guys who he's going to be planning for for the future of this new team that he's building, then he maybe has to bring it into consideration. Yeah, well, this, this is why this 3-2-5 shape is is such an interesting talking point because it's it, even if it is a short-term thing, it's it is delivering performances and it's delivering results in terms of what we've seen before. And as you say, it, it it does have a massive impact on recruitment if you're if you're keeping it. As you say, there's a left back thing there potentially, but also the way it impacts the dynamic dynamic of the midfield, which is the department that we need to invest in the most. Mm-hmm. Suddenly, the, the the number eights be, be, are now basically tens. So, I mean, I've touched on this last week, I think, but you are then signing like we did a show, didn't we, a few weeks ago, a few months ago, on like targets for Liverpool basically and, and, and my criteria was strictly would basically a fire extinguisher, you know, some kind of destroyer who was very physical and predominantly defensive. But if you're if you're sticking with this now, it really does change that. And suddenly if we if you start getting linked with kind of like expressive technical types who are good in the final third, I've got a bit less of an issue with it now. So it really does mm. have quite an impact on on Liverpool's recruitment. Um it is a bit of a decision to make, really, for Klopp. Um, and that that's I mean, one thing I found frustrating over the weekend, I didn't actually I didn't attend the uh, the Spurs game, but I, I watched it on on Sky and oh my word. I, I, I couldn't uh, <laughs> some of the comments he made was was really winding me up. Like yeah. Gary Neville kept kept referencing the uh, how how the three two five was basically not possible and how it was a band aid, even though Arsenal and Manchester City have been doing it all season and then literally first and second in the league. Jamie Redknapp just um, before the game said he, he just doesn't like it. And is, is, is it, I felt his reasoning behind why he doesn't like it is because it's quite, it's not conventional really, is it? It's not like a normal thing that you see, a three box. Three People fear shit. change, Josh. People fear change. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. But I was kind of like, why don't you like it though? What, what is it that what, what makes it a band aid and things like that? Because it's delivering performances compared to before. It's delivering the counter press. It's getting the most out of Trent. It's getting a fair bit out of Salah. Hmm. Um, if you look at the players in the in the system, it works for quite a few of them. Like, I, although it's asking a lot of Canate, if there's one player who can do all that, it probably is Canate. Uh, it's getting kicked the most out of Curtis Jones. Things like this. So. Yeah, I don't know. It's 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 an assistant topic, though. I think for me, there's a little bit of the fact that because the teams at the top are now doing it, it feels like a newfangled trend or just like a fad. And so anyone who kind of comes to it late is almost a little bit dismissed as, oh, you're just copying them. Rather than what it probably actually is, is a whole season of Klopp and his coaches scratching their heads saying, what is wrong? How do we fix this? We've tried this, it's not working. We've tried this, it's not working. Let's look at this. And they've looked, as I said, at what they've got in the squad, the players they've got, what suits them. And they've said, okay, maybe we can adapt this. And in regards to future, the guys who are going to be leaving are mostly the guys who this doesn't really suit very well, to be honest. And the guys that are staying, because... If we've been saying for the long ages, like, if you're going to be using Harvey Elliott as a midfielder, how is it going to work? If you're going to use Curtis, where does he fit? And it wasn't really, is he a front three player? Is he a midfield eight? There was questions. These seem to answer a lot of those questions. So yeah. 
it can look from the outside as if we've just jumped on the bandwagon. But the reality is, is that this is probably a long-term trial and error structural thing where they've finally gone, okay, let's look at this one. Well, how do you feel about that, though, out of interest? Because I'll be honest, I I don't overly like that we are a little bit late to it. I, it, I don't think it looks... It doesn't feel great that Arsenal mm. and City have been doing it all season and we've suddenly realised and all essentially copied and it started mm. to help us as well. What? How do you feel about that? Because it's... As well, I, said, I mean, it, doesn't, it doesn't feel great, does it? I know what you mean. And you did, but ultimately, the fact that it's helping is what we wanted. And for so long this season, we felt. I mean, we've sat here and said, "This gonna be like it's gonna be shit for the whole season." Like we have no idea how on earth we're gonna stop seeing that absolute mess that we were seeing. And they found it. So on that hand, it's like that was what we wanted. This is what we've got. But I know what you mean. It does feel a little bit like, damn. Can you thought of that? But yeah, again, yeah. maybe they did. And this is the thing that we, the part of it that we aren't privy to. Maybe there were conversations back and forth between Pep and Linders and Klopp and Pep saying, look, we can do this too. And Klopp's like, ah, but look at what it does to this and look at what it does to this. And over the course of the season, watching other teams <clears> do it, Pep's been able to say, yeah, but see, look at how they do this. We can do this with this and this and this. And it's been an ongoing dialogue rather than something they've just come to. That's what I want to believe. But obviously we have no idea either way. Yeah, I mean, one, one curious thing about it though is, even though it's helped us and I think it's, as I said, it's it's helped the counter press, it's helped certain players and specifically Trent and his impact on games and things like that, but we are still relentlessly getting attacked down that right side and it is, it's it's getting old now. It's It's like, <laughs> it's been happening for quite a while now and it's I mean, last night against Fulham, it felt like they just, at no, even though Costas was playing, who's who's not amazing, is he? I mean, he's not, he's not the best left back in the world. There was still nothing down, down that that side. And Van Dijk, as you say, is human this season. It's still relentlessly down Liverpool's right, and uh, it just that's got to stop eventually. <laughs> well, I, I think there were a couple down the left. I mean, there was one where Harry Wilson got in and where I thought he was offside and he wasn't. Yeah, offside. yeah, yeah. I remember that. Um, and again, there's it's, it's the same thing you saw Son taking advantage of and the same thing we've spoken about in the past. We've got a little bit of a wonky line sometimes in terms of the, the defensive line and players are able to kind of run in and kind of dive in around the side of it and stay on side. So that's a worry. But yeah, in terms of how teams try to play against us, it's been, like I said, it's been the same for a long time. So I don't think anyone's going to change it until they see a reason to change it. And at the moment, it's difficult because they're still getting used to what they need to do when. I think the com communication between Trent and Canate is vital in that. So Trent knows when he's needed to be pulled back into the four and when he's moving forward, Canate needs to know and Virgil needs to know. And then they need to kind of go into their three-man positions as opposed to their four-man position. And all this has to be done on the fly. They have to be able to be watching each other so they know what's going, but also watching the man that they're marking. So it's not going to be perfect. And when you add to that, the problems with athleticism that we've had all season, whereby yeah. last night you could, like, I looked at the players and there was a couple of times when there was a ball that was passed behind Fabinho and you just saw his shoulder sag before he started to run back. I thought, oh God, they're gassed already. And I looked up <laughs> and it was like 52 minutes. And I mean, to be fair to Henderson, right? He still ran. He was still putting in those pressing runs. And it was hurting him. You, like I could literally see it in his face. He was just thinking, how long have I got to do this for? But the fact is, is that they can't do it like we need them to for as long as we need them to anymore. That's just a fact. And when that is incorporated into it, that's when the gaps appear. And teams who are good, technically, like Fulham are, will be able to, if they have got good energy, wait around and create those chances later on in the game. 
Yeah, there the was a moment in the game actually. I think it was like it was towards the end. It was around like the eighty minute mark or something like that. Um, and Henderson, I don't know if he if he took a knock or slipped or or something, but there was there was a moment towards the end of the game where Fulham were kind of growing in the game, and and Henderson went to his knees, I think, and he was kind of uh, I don't know what he was doing. He was getting his breath or something. And um, I was with uh, I was with Clobby Bloxham at the time, sitting next to it on the ground, and I said to her take a picture of that Henderson on his knees like that and that that kind of epitomizes the season really doesn't it because he was kind yeah. of he was he was leaning on his hands on his knees and he just looked shattered and uh, it does feel like the story of the season really yeah um, <clears throat> but if we if we move on to our kind of maybe next talking points one, one thing I do want to touch on on the back of last night um you keep him with the the three two five theme is Darwin Nunes. Um, he's an insistent one, isn't he? He really is. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's... Um, I don't know what... Again, I don't know what it looks like from the, from the telly, but people watching from home, but he, he tries really, really hard. Really, really hard, but a lot of the time it does feel... It, it's a bit like he's playing with a blindfold or, mm. or, or like he's... Um, I don't know what what you make of of his fifth and, and his first season and and what the plan is essentially for for him next next team. It's difficult because <clears throat> I I feel the same as you when I look at him. It's just like he always somehow seems to make the wrong decision, <laughs> like almost at every turn. And it's not like he's purposefully doing the wrong thing. Like he's I'm Magavik, I'm gonna go off on my own. It's just that sometimes it's, it's the composure element to it he doesn't have at the moment. Yeah. And I do think, I know that we've kind of touched on it previously and some people kind of made jokes around it. I do think that he doesn't really fully understand what we're asking him to do. Like, literally doesn't fully understand what we're asking him to do. And that's a problem now because when you look at his season as a whole, he had his early struggles. He had time in and outside, obviously, the suspension early on. Then he's had a few knocks. And then he had this little period of scoring just before the World Cup and you thought, okay, maybe he's getting it. And then it kind of went away. And then he had another little run and you think maybe he's getting it again. But where we are now, what the performances we're seeing now don't look like they're any further forward in terms of adapting and to what they were early on in the season. I think that's the thing that's got a lot of people concerned. However... I do think we need to remember the human element within all of this. And I think it's massive in, in him. When we think about the pressure that he's been under this whole tenure, when you think about the way Liverpool have been struggling, so he hasn't really had any kind of foundations from which to build. And he really doesn't understand <laughs> yet. Yeah. And I mean, I keep almost laughing at it, but we just assume that everybody can come over and learn English straight away. It's hard. Not everyone has the same abilities and it takes some people and you can be sat in a room told to do it for hours and hours. You could be working your hardest and it's still just not taking in. And so that can be frustrating, but it can also be frustrating for the people around him. So you get that situation where maybe the bonding within the team is not as strong as it could or should be. And all of these things start to bleed in. All of that said, I'm still not concerned because there are eerie similarities to his first season in Benfica, like eerie similarities. All that I said, team having a bad season. That year, Benfica were trophyless, their worst season in about 10 years. Um, he was in and out of the side for injury. He had five different injuries, including knee surgery. He was playing in different formations, playing with different people. And he scored, what was it, 14 goals in 41 games. Second season, more settled in every way, 34 goals in 41. So there is a light that can still be switched. I'm not putting into the scrap heap or anything like that. What I would say, though, is that where we are now and sitting today, I think the start of the season, the expectation is that if we've got three forwards, then Gakpo is ahead of him in the pecking order uh, for the central role. And I'd say Diaz is ahead of him in the pecking order for the role on the left-hand side. 
Yeah, but I think one of the issues with that is he he did cost eighty five million <coughs> um, club record fee. Yes. So I don't know what I find weird about it. Again, I don't have too many doubts about like his ceiling. I feel like I can picture Nunes hitting full potential, and the the vision that I've got of that in my head is an absolute killer, and and someone who. Is just a monster and, and, and just hoovers up chances and scores relentlessly and super intense and physical and uh, combative and, and, and things like that. But I think my, my biggest thing with it is just I, I still I really can't see what the plan was. I don't I don't know what the plan was for him. If if the plan was for him to come in and replace Firmino, that is a huge change to uh, to navigate considering the differences between the players on the ball and off the ball, really. Um, Firmino was as defensively good as you, you're ever going to get from a number nine. Nunes has the hard work element attached to his game, but in terms of the the intelligence of, of where and when to do it, positioning and, and all that stuff, he's still very raw. I think Klopp described him as a resource last night in that sense, in yeah. terms of just wanting to kind of run off and close down and, and things like that. And that was so, very telling for me. No, that, that, the point that why you use that word, because I think he was trying to say it positively, but it also does kind of feel a little bit like it's out of control. Although, to be fair, to most yeah. resources, they kind of know where they're going, at least. <laughs> yeah. It is just the roughest of diamonds, but but the, the, the crucial thing in there is he's still the diamond, though. The, the diamond is still there. Um, even despite these things that we're saying, he's still averaging the most shots per 90 in the Premier League this season by a distance. 4.5 per 90. Mitrovic is the next best on four. Then Erling Haaland on 3.6. Uh, but I suppose one of the major differences between between those players I've just named is so far with his finishing, Nunes has scored about two or three goals less than expected. So he's underperforming with his finishing. Haaland, for example, has scored seven or eight goals more than expected. So he's been a clinical finisher and Nunes hasn't. Um but I do think I do think Haaland is the template for Nunes. I know they look probably worlds apart this season, but I do think they're similar in the sense that you probably want to keep them away from possession. They are both tall, rapid, good in the air, very good in transition, like to chase the ball in behind. I think they're very, very similar. But I think for that to happen, I think the players behind Nunes have to do all of that for them almost and feed him in the box. And if they're going to feed him in the box and he's going to be that player, he can't be underperforming his, his expected goals either. So it's just such a weird one. Like I think is it, one of his biggest issues is probably just his ability to make the ball stick. I think his, his, yeah. his ball retention is just a bit of an issue. Like he... In addition to just getting dispossessed all the time, his passing accuracy is the worst in, in the Liverpool squad this season in the Premier League by quite a distance. Um, is is passing pass completions sixty four percent, which you know for perspective, there's a thirty six percent chance that one of Nunes's passes is going to go to an opponent based yeah. on that. Um, the and next he, and he's is, not passing over long distances either. Yeah, yeah. The next worst is 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 Gakpo on seventy four percent. That's ten percent difference, ten percent better. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, really, really rough diamond. And uh, in terms of the the three two five, I, I don't exactly know where he fits. I mm -hmm. uh, know we've tried them on the on the wings, and but I don't think his all round possession game is good enough. And I think uh, we've tried them through the middle now, and I I think when the expectation is still for our number nine to drop into into deeper spaces and provide a bit of a link. I, I don't overly see him doing that that well. So it's it's an interesting one. For me, I think in terms of the plan, two things you mentioned. One, the, the, the finishing. I think that when you're a striker, goals do solve a lot of the problems. And I felt like they maybe felt that he would score enough that it wouldn't be an issue while he learns everything else. The second thing is, I genuinely think they probably would have thought he'd have picked it up a little bit quicker than he has. 
Like when you talk about, we knew that his passing wasn't great. Not great is, as you say, 75%. That's not terrible. You can live with that and you can improve on it. So they probably didn't think it was going to be getting 64% and without it having that much of an improvement. So maybe they thought that those things wouldn't be as bad and some of the good things that he does would mask those while he gets up to speed. I also don't think that they anticipated as many other problems around them, <clears throat> which again is going to have a detrimental effect to him. I think there's lots of things that have happened over the course of the season that they should have predicted that have affected him. And there are some that they couldn't have that have affected him. The question is, is how much of those are going to linger and how much of those can he slowly start to grip? Maybe, I dare say, it will help him if we get one of his friends in. I don't know, someone from the same country, perhaps? <laughs> yeah. Well, that we will touch on that in a sec, actually. Um, but at the same time, I mean, he he's supposed to be quite close to Luis Diaz. You know, I think they knew each other as opponents from the, the Portuguese league, obviously. Um, but I, I, he does feel a bit like a navigator for me in terms of very, very high ceiling and shows up in the numbers as super threatening and super active and uh, things like that. But similar to Keita, he's arrived in the country, can't speak the language, um, seems to be very raw in, in a lot of his tactical element, in, in a lot of the tactical elements of the game. and. And things like that, and obviously the plan with with Naby was to to work with him. I think Klopp described him as a long term project on a number of occasions. Mm. One of the issues is just didn't really end up working with Keita was was injuries. If if Darwin can avoid those and, and he can stay fit, I think long term, I still I still expect him to explode at, at Anfield. Um, whether it will be as soon as next season, I don't actually know. It depends on the development of the team and how the summer goes for him and how quickly he starts to, to turn this corner and, and pick up the language and, and stuff like that and get integrated into English football because he does he's 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 still kind of playing like it's his debut. <laughs> you you would have yeah. thought last night was his <laughs> debut, I think. Um he's st he still seems panicked. He still seems rushed, uncomfortable a little bit when receiving the ball. Um, unsure and uncertain when it comes to facing up his man and, and what he's going to do to beat him. And if you look at Diaz in the same in, in similar situations and Gakpo in similar situations, it just seems a lot more natural for them to just find a teammate or or beat their opposite number or or whatever it is. Nunes just seems to me like to be a tip of the spear and basically let him finish the moves for you, even though this season he hasn't looked like the greatest finisher. So it's it's an interesting one, but you, you mentioned there on Sans feelings. <laughs> I'm just painting them as terrible like that, aren't I? I mean, it's funny because you can take so many things that we say in, like, in contact, you can make a super cut of us saying absolutely <laughs> trashing him, or of him saying he's the greatest player in the world. And maybe we should do that and just save them from week to week. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's an interesting one to say the least. You know, it's definitely a talking point. Um I think it's just one of the reasons is why why it's so weird is because uh we're just so used to Liverpool getting attacking signings in particular right all the time, you know. Sadio Mane, Firmino and and Salah and you kind of then you get in Diaz and he's an absolute monster, you get in Jota, he explodes out of nowhere and starts scoring twice as many goals needed for Wolves and stuff. So when Liverpool have a player who's got season problems, it's just curious to see where he's going to end up positionally and, and stuff like that and with his status in the team. But you mentioned his teammate getting in someone who he knows. I'm assuming you are referencing Manuel Ugarte there. Um, there's some links coming out of, I think, Uruguay or, or Portugal to suggest that Liverpool have kind of inquired or, or something along those lines. Uh, what are your thoughts on him? Um, I like him as a player. I think he was someone who we discussed earlier in the season. I think back then what I said was is that I was leaning towards looking at João Paulini ahead of him because of his age, his experience. But I'm not so sure anymore. <laughs> like... 
the thing that I love about Ugarte when I watch him, and it's all it's, it's almost like his strength could also be a bit of a weakness at times, but I love it anyway. He is a fighter, like an absolute yeah. dog. And there have been times over the last few seasons where we haven't seen enough of that in this Liverpool team. Like I heard some people saying behind me last night, they're going to stop singing the Virgil van Dijk song because they don't want him to be calm as you like anymore. He's too calm. <laughs> <laughs> we, we need him to, to sharpen up a bit. And I, as much as that's probably a joke, I do think there's a little bit of that throughout the side that we need to be a little bit more gnarly. We need to be a little bit more intense. We need to be a little bit more energetic. And he's all of those things and more. I think when you look at his style of play, the person who I think we all know who I'd refer him to most is Ungolo Kante. I think yeah. he has the ability to look like there's two of him. Because he's just everywhere and he's not giving the ball away. He's great at recycling possession. He's not playing 50-yard passes because he can get the ball to the guy who normally does that. But he's able to be in advanced areas. He can win the ball back there. He can be effective all across the midfield. He's young. Uh, it, the price for him is set because <laughs> he's got a release clause, which is always good because it means just pay the money, sort out the personal terms, get the shit done, and we can move on. So it could potentially be a quick deal as long as there's not 50 other teams all in for him, which there may well be. So I can see all of the reasons why this guy sits Liverpool. The only downside to him, aside from his wild manness and his ability to potentially pick up yellows, is he's not tall. He's not, he's not tiny, but he's not tall. He is able to still kind of shoulder into people and kind of maneuver himself around in a bit of a genie-esque fashion or N'Golo Kante. But I do think one of the midfielders we bring in is going to have to be the, the proverbial brick outhouse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to, to be honest, I, I thought he was shorter than he is, though, like watching him. I would have thought he's about five eight, but he's uh, he's actually just basically six foot. He's, he's just under six foot, uh, five eleven and a half by all accounts. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, be before we moved to this three two five shape or, or whatever you want to call it, he would have probably been the absolute perfect player that I would have suggested Liverpool need in terms of this kind of destroying. Pressuring, pressurizing dog type thing mm -hmm. who just loves uh, he's just so hungry without the ball, uh, really aggressive and proactive on the defensive side of the game. And when he's got the ball, relentlessly keeps it. He, he ranks in the, the 99th percentile on uh, on FB ref across Europe for um, just basic pass completion, mm -hmm. averages about uh, 91.3%. Uh, completion so very rarely gives the ball away and he also ranks in the 90th percentile among midfielders for for, for take-ons as well so it, that that kind for me that immediately paints a bit of a wine album picture there in terms of never gives the ball away and if you put him in really sticky situations you can just kind of get his way out of it somehow yeah. um and then if you look at his defensive numbers 99th percentile for tackles 98th percentile for interceptions and 89th for blocks if you want to throw that in there as well so extremely defensively active very very energetic very hungry workhorse if he wants and with the ball keen dribbler in certain moments and, and never loses it so that's kind of what i would have liked initially um i suppose it kind of changes a little bit with this uh 325 simply because Unless he's going to replace Fabinho in the team, which is a possibility, um, he would otherwise play as a ten, which is where kind of Henderson is playing at the minute. And and, and I I prefer the link to like Mount and and McAllister and potentially even Gravenberg for for, for that that role as well. You guys say I can think I, I I pitch it a little bit deeper this season. Sporting have played. 3-4-3 three, three, pretty much all season and he's played as part of their double pivot mm -hmm. um so i'm not sure 
what to think about that. I, th- I do think he's still worth tracking and and if we sign him, I wouldn't have an issue with it or anything like that. But in terms of being perfectly suited to what Liverpool have suffered from this season, I think, I think he was suited to us a bit more before the tactical switch. I think he can still do it. I mean, if you look at the role that Fabinho plays in it, he can do it all. He can do all of those things. I think... But then I mean, would, you, not... would you take Fabinho off the team now? Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> put it this way. Put it this way. I would be... yes. <laughs> I mean, put it this way. I, I'm not saying that I would never play Fabinho again. No. But I would have the two of them battle for the starting position with the expectation that Agate will win the role. And that... <laughs> Therefore, you'd be having Fabinho playing, maybe start or show. Fabinho starting, let's say, 12 to 15 league games and maybe three in the Champions League. Still coming off the bench in the majority of those games he's not starting. Still contributing. still Because this is the thing. And this is the key to what we're going to be able to do next season. Klopp has to be honest with himself. He loves Fabinho. He loves Henderson. Probably likes Thiago. I don't think he has that same love for him as the other two. But he has to be honest with what they can do. And yeah. he, they can still be top players if you use them sparingly. And I well, think that's what's going to have to happen. And again, I put Thiago in there. I, I do think that we're now going to have to assume that we don't have him. And that when we do yeah. have him, it's a bonus. I, I don't think we're ever going to have to... So I don't think we're going to ever be able to game plan for 25 to 30 games, Premier league games a season out of Thiago. Because I don't think we, it, it, it's going to leave ourselves short. So this is what I mean about being honest with yourself. Rather than saying, I believe in these guys, they can do it. Yes, they can do it. They just can't do as often as we need them to anymore. And we have to protect them in order so that when we do need them, they can still do it. Yeah, I, I said on the, on Redman TV actually a couple of weeks ago, I think if I was a sporting director and I'd never watched... Liverpool playing my life and I had only watched this season and it was my job to analyse what's wrong with the team and where we can upgrade. I said at the time, like, I, I think I'd be looking at the six. I, I'd be looking at Fabinho and thinking we, we can get better than that. Um, yeah. And it's a shame because, as, as you say, we, we do love him and he's been, he's been brilliant. And he, I, I, to be fair to him, he has experienced a bit of an upturn past couple of weeks in terms of... Um, having a, a, a box around him and, and Trent next to him and stuff like that. But, you know, whether you want to put yourself in a position where you need to give your six that much cover to cope is is a question. Um, the six is meant to be doing the job of two people. That's his job. That's And again, yeah. so ha- having two p- people to cover for him is, is kind of counterproductive. And, like, there were times last night where Fab did look like his old self. There were a couple of times where... He found himself with three Fulham players around him. He was still able to hold them off and play the ball. And he did one of the the old Fabinho tackles where he kind of flamingo hooks his leg around someone and just clicks it away, which yeah. we haven't seen him do in literally like three years. So he still has those abilities. We just need to protect him to preserve them. Yeah. I mean, the, mid- the midfield, the rumour mill across Europe is is starting to heat up, isn't it? Yeah. Um, we saw this week that Jude Bellingham seems to be going to Real Madrid. Um, we'll leave that one there. <laughs> <laughs> but what, yeah, one thing yeah. I do want to say, though... Can we, just, can we just pretend that guy doesn't exist now? Is that, <laughs> yeah, is that, yeah. Is that thing? yeah, yeah. We'll try not to mention him ever again, I think. Um, <laughs> but one thing I did want to pat myself on the back for is uh, I think Enzo Lafay is being linked with Dortmund as his replacement, which is interesting. I did say a couple of months ago that he's showing up as an absolute monster in the numbers and somebody will pick him up. Yes. And if he, if he replaces Bellingham with Dortmund, that'll be interesting. And when we did there, I, I think we did a scouting picks show a few months ago where we just talked about players we liked. One of the lads I mentioned was uh, was the captain of Feyenoord, uh, Orkan Koku. And he has this week being linked with Liverpool actually and he's getting linked with Dortmund still only 22 does absolutely everything for Feyenoord takes set pieces and captains them and everything um so there's there's lots of links uh appearing from 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 across Europe another link is just from within the Premier League and we'll we'll round up with this with this chat is Alexis McAllister 
Uh, I do think, again, he was talked about by us earlier in the season. People, regular listeners of the show will, will know I'm a huge fan of him. I think he's such a clever, intelligent player in terms of his decision-making and things like that. can play anywhere, really, in the centre of the pitch. What are your thoughts on him? Uh, yeah, I'm all in as well. And I've always thought people look at Caicedo and him and say that Caicedo's the better player. And I'm not sure. I, I honestly think that in terms of what Liverpool needs, if you're going to be signing someone like Agate, for example, then I think he gives us more. I think winning the ball high up the pitch is something that he's really good at. His tackle numbers are superb. But as you say, it's the intelligence, not only to find space, but to adapt the different systems he's played in all around the midfield, defensive, attacking and centrally and out wide for, for Brighton and for teams back in Argentina. <clears throat> so I think that he's a really, really good player who can find his niche in our team. And whereas previously <clears throat> I was a bit concerned about if you're buying him, what does that mean for Curtis and for Harvey? But now if this new system is going to be more regular, if not the thing, then you can see space for all of them because they're going to be needing two of them in the lineup and therefore they'll always need another one on the bench. So they're all going to remain involved. I like that. I like the fact, again, attitude-wise, he's, he's, he's more low-key gnarly, but he's still gnarly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, he, he, ta he takes pens as well, so maybe that can give uh, Salah a break if he ever needs one. Um, but I think he's been in the Premier League for a long time, which is a bonus. When we look at Brighton players who've left Brighton and who haven't performed well, I think the key thing that they've all had in common is that they have been asked to do things that they didn't get asked to do at Brighton. So Kukurilla... They said he could play as a third centre-half, but he didn't really do it. Um, <laughs> Misuma wasn't really playing as part of a midfield three with wing-backs either side and three centre-halves behind him. And all of these things you can start to see becoming an issue. With McAllister, like I said, because he's been used in so many roles already for Brighton, I don't think that's going to be an issue for us. So if the money's right, and it seems like... By all intents and purposes, he's looking like he wants to come to us. I think it could be a really good deal. Yeah, I've, I've said before, he, he reminds me a lot of Gundogan in terms of he can just play as a, as a double six if you need him to. He can play as a number eight and he can play as a number ten. And with a player like that, it really does give you options in terms of whether we're keeping this 3 two, 5 or, or not. He's not a problem regardless of what you're doing. Because he can just kind of play anywhere within the confines of the middle of the pitch. You know, he's not, he's certainly not a player for the flanks, but in terms of the middle, he can just do it all basically. I think he offers elements of what Thiago was giving us over the past couple of seasons and what Ryan Alden was trying to do towards the back end of his Liverpool career mm -hmm. in terms of basically control. I think uh, he just he, he keeps the ball, he's never, never flustered, really relaxed and cool, um, puts a foot in more than you'd expect as well. Yeah. His numbers are difficult to analyse because he's played all, like a fair amount of minutes as a centre mid and a fair amount of minutes as a number ten. So it's it's difficult to determine how he shows up in comparison to his peers because his, uh, is his peer James Madison or, or is it Moise Casado? You know, playing in completely different areas of the pitch. So. It looks like he, he he keeps the ball anyway. He makes the ball stick. Makes really good decisions on the ball, as you say. He's good at penalties. Attack minded. Um, really technical and just a super intelligent player. Really. Mm -hmm. Um, I think in in terms of Casado as well, like you've just mentioned there, that they're both genuinely brilliant. Um, Casado is different though in the sense that he offers you control through probably what Fabinho was offered over the past couple of seasons in terms of just allowing you to sustain the tax by just regaining the ball so often and putting out those fires. Um, I think if you're replacing Fabinho and you want someone like that to come in, Casado I think is perfect. But then, as one of the two tens, Casado is probably not doing that. No. Whereas McAllister is probably not doing 
the long six either. So I don't know. There's so many different possibilities, isn't there? Well, that can be a bit I I think I think if you're looking at Agate, and you can say that he, you're going to get most of what well you get what you get from Caicedo for cheaper, and then if you pair him with McAllister, then between the two of them, I think you've got most of the profiles covered. I'd like, although <laughs> I do think I don't know if I'm harping on about this too much. They are both little, though, aren't they? <laughs> 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 maybe, maybe we need Ryan Gravenberch in there as well to bring up the height. Average. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe we need to start playing Nunes a bit more, or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> revamp him as a centre mid. You mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Playing as a centre half. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we'll uh, we'll we'll wrap up there. I think uh, covered a fair few few elements over the past month, I suppose, considering you've been out of action, mate. But it's been really good to have you back. Oh, yeah. I'm very pleased to get to share my opinions with all of you. I hope you don't think that they're all a bunch of trash. <laughs> well, after a period of kind of uh, upheaval and, and rotations and things like that, I think it is safe for me to say that we are back to normal now in terms of um, co-hosts and, and things like that. Um, if Mo ever can't appear on, I assume that the backup now will, will comfortably be Andrew Beasley, who put in, as I said, solid performances the past couple of weeks. But yeah, I think we're back to normality, much like Liverpool, hopefully. Yeah. Uh, hopefully we can keep up the the winning run. If we don't, and if we lose our next game, next week Mo will not be appearing. On <laughs> <laughs> Come on, yeah. Liverpool! <laughs> hopefully that's not a coincidence, mate. Hopefully that's not a coincidence, but yeah, we'll see anyway. But yeah, thanks for joining us and uh, we will see you next week.